gentlemen, week four is here. Can you believe it, man? It's going really fast. But some make or break games for teams already so far this season. Uh, we have the Vipers looking for their first win. We have the Guardians looking to get in the win column after two abysmal weeks. And why don't we just start there? Why not? It's the first game on Saturday. Let's go the LA it. Wildcats coming off that huge win versus the D.C. Defenders. They were at home for two weeks. Now they're back going across to the East Coast to visit the New York Guardians, who are in desperate need of a win. And if you look at this game and really break it down, it's two teams that have so many injuries that they're dealing with. Um, New York, especially at their quarterback position, McGloin has been rolled out for the Wildcats. Nelson Spruce, their number one receiver's out. Uh, Martez Carter, at, as the time of this recording, has been listed as doubtful. So a lot of weapons for each team expected not to play in this game. So, Glessner, mm -hmm. what are you looking at when you look at the Wildcats and Guardians? And what do the Guardians have to do to get yeah. that much-needed win and really turn their season around? Because right now it's a mess. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think it's going to be very pretty at 2 o'clock on Saturday uh, for sure. Um, I, I think what the Wildcats showed me last week is how good they can be on defense. And, and what they did on defense with a D.C. team that we thought was the most complete team in the XFL, mm -hmm. and they essentially dismantled them, forced a bunch of turnovers. I, I don't see New York being able to score many points, of, uh, if any at all. Uh, with McGloin out, Marquise Williams back in, kind of a non-existent running game. Uh, the passing game has been shaky at best. The offensive line looks like it's in shambles. Mm -hmm. um, the line is at eight right now, favoring the Wildcats at minus eight. Over sounds under about, about right. That sounds about right. The over uh, the over under is at 39. I'm going to take the Wildcats winning big. They will cover the spread at eight. Yeah. And But I'm going to take the under because, frankly, I don't think New York's going to score. They may score a field goal. They may get a garbage time touchdown, but I think it's going to look a lot like last week for New York. Yeah, it's not the worst prediction there, Gless. Um, I don't trust New York's offense, and I don't trust Marquise Williams. And I really, you know, I, I'd like to give Perez the benefit of the doubt, but I don't necessarily trust that New York can protect him with their offensive line. So I'm with you, Gless. I think they'll cover easily. I think they'll cover the eight. I think L.A., even with a couple injuries on offense, is still good enough with Josh Johnson and Jordan Smallwood and um, Trey McBride to go out there and just really pile it on them. And I think uh, L.A. does win big this week as well. I agree with you, Gless. Gless, as a player and then a coach, just I'm, I'm looking at it, and there's been so much pressure put on this defense, who we all think is one of the better defenses in the league, especially the secondary. But at some point, it's just too much. And there's just, you know, yeah. when you see your offense in such turmoil – in the such lack of discipline, especially on that side of the football, where your your leader, your quarterback, is throwing tantrums on the sideline, your center's getting booted out of the game, he's getting benched, mm -hmm. they can't score. It just and you're on the field constantly. Mm. You were so susceptible as a team for division in the locker room. Yeah, because the yeah. defense is just at yeah. some point they're going to get fed up with it. Yeah, y yeah. There's no doubt about it. I mean, as a coach and be as positive as you can but as a player you're on the field and when you're always on the field and you're looking up and it's you know the game is slowly getting away from you and then you let the special team you know then the special teams unit kind of lets you down as well mm -hmm. it's demoralizing and really the leaders have to step up and somebody's got to make a play somebody's got to make uh, a play on offense mm -hmm. somebody's got to stand up on defense and also make a play um but I mean, I, I feel bad for the guys on defense. I feel like that they are good as a unit, but unfortunately they're just put in bad spots and it, it's hard to be good on defense when you're constantly given short fields um, and when you're always on the field. Yeah, and then Gilbride pulled Mikael McKay to the side of the last game versus the Battle Hawks. And it's like, you're gonna have to step up being a leader because some of the guys who are supposed to be leaders on this team aren't doing that. Not that yet. just shows you the state of the New York Guardians right now. So there's no way I could pick them in this game. No the no Wildcats way. and Josh Johnson are just playing too well on offense. Yep. It seems like Josh Johnson has gotten the rust off. Uh, he played pretty well in the second half versus the Renegades. And then we all know what he did versus the D.C. defenders throwing three touchdowns. He looked good, especially on the deep ball. I know that they're missing Spruce. I know they're going to miss Carter and Hood. Mm -hmm. So they're missing a lot of pieces, but I think they have enough to – to overcome the Guardians who are just reeling right now. So I'm going to yep. take the Wildcats on the road. Let's go to the next game. The Seattle Dragons 
are visiting the St. Louis Battlehawks, who are home for the second week in a row. And I'm not expecting them to let up at all in terms of that home crowd. So Seattle, no. whose home, who's, who they're used to that home crowd behind them, is now going to have them cheering against them. <laughs> And they're a team, too, that needs to get in the win column and really figure mm-hmm. out that passing game and get a consistent running game going. But they're playing a Battlehawks team that's been very opportunistic on defense, mm-hmm. especially mm-hmm. in the secondary. So, Gless, you're a Seattle guy, man. What do the Seattle Dragons need to do to get in the win column here and stun <laughs> the uh, St. Louis Battlehawks? Well, they just need to be way more productive in the pass game. Their pass game has been, quite honestly, pretty embarrassing the last two weeks. Um, Rarely, you know, really nothing down the field, a lot of dinking and dunking. And their kind of one saving grace was really pounding the rock. And last week that Mm -hmm. seemed to, that just wasn't there. So I think offensively, if they can be uh, effective in the pass game, I think they have a shot here. Um, because I, I, I'm still a huge believer in that defense. Um, they have the the number one tackler in the NFL right now in Steven Johnson. Um, but I really like the way that unit is playing. Uh, it's actually the largest line of the weekend as St. Louis at minus 11 and a half uh, and over really? under is 30. Yeah, a surprisingly large line. So I'm actually going to take... Huh. Um, I'm going to take Seattle in this, the plus 11 and a half. I think this game's going to be closer than that. I think it's going to be pretty close until probably about the start of the fourth quarter where I think St. Louis, um, I, I think they get a score late. I think Seattle surprises people with how well um, – they play on defense. I, I really do. I, I think the biggest thing with St. Louis is they're so dynamic in the run game, um, but I think that plays right into Seattle's strength. Seattle's really good in the box. A lot of great linebackers, really great up front. I think they prove to be a lot harder than St. Louis thinks they're going to be. Um, so I'm going to take Seattle to cover the uh, plus 11 and a half. Uh, I'm also going to take the under in this one as well, um, but I think St. Louis squeaks by Seattle. Mm. I really thought yeah, he was going I, with Seattle um, there. I know, I know. I was tempted. <laughs> <laughs> I go back and f- I, I went back and forth, back and forth on this game in terms of the spread because I do think. Uh, let me just get this out of the way. I, St. Louis is going to win this game. I think they're going to yeah. win. That's my pick to win. I went really back and forth on the spread. It's a huge spread, and I was going to lean with you, Gless, and go Seattle covering that eleven and a half, but. The more I dug into pro football focus and the more I read about St. Louis, St. Louis is a super complete team. They're only allowing 16% of pressures. When when Jordan Tiamu drops back to pass, they're only allowing pressure 16% of the time. Let me think of it. That's a better way to phrase that. That's the lowest in the league. That's the best line in the league. And their defense has the best defense in the league at getting pressure. I think that's just going to be a combination that's going to be too much for Seattle to handle. So I do think – that St. Louis will cover. I think the home field advantage is going to be big. I think they're going to cover, but it's not going to feel like a blowout. I know that sounds weird because they they might win by, you know, 14 to 18 points, somewhere around there. I think I think Seattle will keep within striking distance for most of the game, but I think by the end of it, it's going to be one of those games where you look at, at the final score and be like, yeah, you know, it, it, yeah. it seemed a lot closer than the score, but St. Louis pulled away at yeah. the end and won by about, you know, 15, 18 points, yeah. something like that. Seattle's just not good enough on offense, Riley. I mean, no. I think that's ultimately what it comes down to. I mean, I, I love what they do on defense, and Kenny, I, I think I heard the same there. It's just it's just not going to be enough. So, yeah. Gless, I'm wondering, like, at this point, like, I think we're all on the same page. You have to stick with Silvers at quarterback. I know that may get some pushback from yep. fans, but I don't think yep. any of us believe that B.J. Daniels is a viable answer at the quarterback position. No. Um, I think I think Silvers has a lot of blame that he can take on his shoulders, but also it's the lack of weapons um, around him. But I'm also curious, like they so the Seattle offense is predicated on the run, you know, run first, pass second, and they kind of struggled with that last week. And I'm just they have three good running backs, but at what point do you just have to? Ha- you know, ride the hot hand and stop worrying about splitting up the carries. Like at, at, at what point Glessner, is it a detriment to your offense that you're worried about, yeah. you know, giving these guys equal amount of carries We're just ride the hot hand, which in my opinion is usually Kenneth Farrow. I know he didn't have a great yeah. rushing game last week, but I think he's your most overall complete back. But at what point do you have to kind of just go with the guy that's playing the best mm-hmm. and just stick with him? 
Yeah, uh, it's a great question. I'm not really sure I'd, I, I have a, a good answer other than when the offense starts to click and really through three weeks, it hasn't really clicked. So I think that they're just trying to find lightning in a bottle and see what's running back kind of takes a hold of the reins. And I don't think Seattle feels like any of the guys have taken a hold of the reins. I mean, the one really nice thing about Pharaoh is – you can use him in a lot of passing downs, like the touchdown last week. They went empty. Yeah, it was a great catch, they, right? They went they, they went empty in the end zone. He had a clear mismatch. Silvers knew he had it and and was able to find Farrow um, right down the seam in a clear mismatch. Yeah. So I I think Riley, I think they're just trying to find a guy who's going to take a hold of it, and none of the guys have really done that yet. I mean, yeah, they've had nice games, but nobody's like had a breakout game like Cameron Artis Payne, right? Or like Matt Jones. Like you kind of know that those are the guys. None of these three guys really stood out. They've all kind of done the same thing from a production yeah, it's, standpoint. It's a good point. I mean, they've had multiple running backs in each of their first three games, average over four yards a carry, but there really hasn't been that one guy that's mm-hmm. broken out. So maybe that's why they're still splitting the carries. But I just wonder at what point is it yeah. more of a detriment worrying about splitting carries three ways, not just two, but three ways between three guys. At what point do you just ride the hot hand? But I think defensively, they need to worry about stopping the run as well. They did a good job in their mm-hmm. first couple of games stopping the run, but um, they were definitely exposed versus Dallas. And I will give, you know, Dallas is probably the best rushing team in the league, but you know who's second best? The St. Louis Battlehawks. Louis Battle Hawk, yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. I, and there's an yeah, argument I, that overall they're the, be- the, 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 they're the best. I would, they may have the best I would running say, back. I, I, would, I, I, would, I would flip them. I think St. Louis Yeah, and I might agree with that. Team, I mean, but, I think, yeah. I think yeah. uh, Dallas may have the best running back in the league, but overall St. Louis may have the best running game they're when you include that yeah. Tamu is, you know, a mobile quarterback. And then they have yep. yeah, they a lot have of quarterback runs, quarterback. man. Yep. They, they, they have design quarterback runs. I mean, it's really, you have to account for everybody. It's not just like a handoff to Cameron artist pain. So, yep. All right. So it's long tough. story short, I'm going with St. Louis and uh, I'm going to pick that they cover. I think they're going to okay. keep building. I mean, at what, at this point I can't pick against them because every, every week right. they seem to be impressing Sorry. me more and more. So until they show me that, you know, they're trending the other way. I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with them. So let's go to the Sunday games, Agreed. probably the game of the week, and this sucks because yep. I believe it's on FS1, isn't it, guys? Yeah. God, man, it'd yep. be awesome Thanks. if this was on yes. one of the major networks. But agreed. Regardless, it's it's probably the matchup of the weekend, and the undefeated Houston Roughnecks are going to Dallas, who has won two in a row. So we got we got ourselves quite a matchup between the two Texas teams. Uh, Gless, let's go ahead and start with you. What is yeah. the line for this game? I, ha- I have to imagine it's pretty <laughs> close, especially since Dallas is at home. It, it's very close. So that this is by far the, the game of the weekend. Uh, it's Houston at one and a half. Um, over-unders at oh, 50, wow, okay. uh, 50 and a half. Yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of like a – I mean, it's the line is so close. I mean, you're essentially picking who's going to win the game. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, that this one, I struggled a lot with this one um, because I, I kind of know where my heart wants to go with it. Um, <laughs> you know, but then I think I I'm right there with you. It. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, I'm like, man, I, I would really like to see this specific team win. But so let's just break down just there. Um, Houston has lived off the big play, right? They've had the most big plays in the league, not even close. Nobody's been able to stop them. And if you have a chance to beat Houston, you have to limit the big plays to a minimum. You got to limit PJ Walker. You have to keep him in the pocket. And for for God's sake, can somebody find Cam Phillips on the field? Can somebody <laughs> find him? Because no, no one, no one appears to have any interest at covering number fourteen. Um, and then you look on the and then you look on the other side with Dallas. Dallas is, you know, they've got an effective running game when they get going, and and it takes them a little while to get going. Now, I think through the first half, I think. Uh, it's it's a pretty close game. I think it's back and forth, back and forth. It's a close game through half. Um, I actually think this game will be extremely tight throughout the end. Um, mm-hmm. I'm going to go with the upset here. I'm going Dallas Renegades Ooh. to get the plus one and a half. Um, I'm going to go, I'm going to hit the over here at 50 and a half as well. Um, I think Landry Jones makes a massive play at the end of the game. Um, to Donald Parham proves to be too much for the Houston Roughnecks to stop. High-scoring affair, back and forth. Guys, I think this also has the potential 
to see maybe our first overtime game as well. The two oh, most so evenly awesome. matched teams we've seen. Yes. So I'm going Dallas wins. Um, but again, it, it's a shootout. Um, and I think Dallas wins uh, and covers that one and a half. Ooh, I would I would love to see an overtime glass. We haven't seen it yeah. yet, and I'm dying to see it in person. Oh, yeah. Like I really, really want to see it. So I, I Gless, I'm with you. I think it's gonna be a super tight game, but I, I have it playing out a little differently than you. I think Houston's gonna get out to a big lead early. I think they're gonna be firing on all cylinders. Houston's gonna Houston's gonna go into halftime with a comfortable lead, and then Dallas is gonna do what Dallas has done. They're going to slowly get going in the second half. They're going to get back in the game, and it's going to come right down to the wire. And I think these two teams, Houston has been a primarily first-half team this year and has kind of, I don't want to say stalled in the second half, but just hasn't played as well as they have in the first half. And Dallas has been the complete opposite. So I think you're going to see Houston up early and quick, and Dallas is going to chip away, chip away, chip away, get going. But I don't think it's going to be quite enough. I think Houston's going to hold off. I think they're going to cover, and I think they're going to win outright. Um, I just don't think Dallas is quite there on their level yet. I'm not going to get cute. I'm not going to get fancy here. I'm going to go with the quarterback <laughs> who's playing the best in the league. All right, that's <laughs> I'm going to go with the team that's, that's the hottest in the league. I'm yep. going to go with Houston here. I do think it's going to be a very close game, which I'm hoping it's going to be a very close game. And I really like the makeup of this Renegades team but we haven't seen them put a complete game together yet. Yep. And I understand that in the second half, they've been extremely impressive, especially running the ball. But we've seen at times that Houston defense has been able to get after the quarterback, especially early in games. And Landry Jones, I feel like, you know, Josh Johnson is looking more polished coming back from injury. And, jo and Landry Jones, while he's had, you know, some fantastic throws, He's clearly still getting back into back into football condition, mm -hmm. back into the game flow. Mm -hmm. And the Houston defense has just been too opportunistic, and Landry Jones has been susceptible to a few bad throws yes. every game. Yes. So I think that's yep. where the Houston Roughnecks are going to capitalize. And I do think that that rene Renegades running game is going to keep them in it. But at this point, I'm not going against my guy Cam Phillips. No way, no how. Hell no, not going to happen. <laughs> And P.J. Walker is the MVP of the league right now. Yes, um, That offense just has yep. not been stopped yet. So I'm not going to go – and the Dallas defense, and you've talked about it, Gless, over and over, how you're still in the wait-and-see mode with the Dallas defense, and they just lost Haloe Kakaha to retirement. So I'm not – I'm just I'm just not in a position where I can pick the upset as much as I really want to because I would love to mm -hmm. see you know, Dallas at home, and I'd love to see Houston – you know, not because I'm rooting against Houston, but just to keep the standings close, you know, the competitive mm -hmm. balance, I would love to see Dallas pull it out here. But I think Houston's going to come out victorious. Yep. Um, obviously, the line is so close. I'm not going to even bother picking that. But I'm just going to go with the Houston Roughnecks. And boy, that'd be awesome. Let's let's root for some overtime. It would right. suck if it was on FS1, the first overtime. But hey, I know. Oh, I'll take overtime wherever I can get it. So let, let's hope for a Houston-Dallas overtime. Man, the XFL would really love that, wouldn't they? be sweet. That'd be great. All right. Let's go to the final game. The D.C. Defenders, who are coming off a whooping out in L.A., are on the road again, and they're going to Tampa Bay, who played well versus Houston, but the Quentin Flowers saga has really Continues. you know brought them back down from that momentum that any momentum that they had coming out of that Houston game I feel has just been trounced on by Quentin Flowers leaving the team at the time of this recording he had been asked to leave the team for personal reasons there's even reports that he has asked to be released so we're not sure we're ever going to see Quentin Flowers in a Tampa Bay Vipers uniform again mm -hmm. their quarterback position is already a mess even with Flowers there so I know that DC um, was just awful last week, but you have to look at the overall, you know, scope of things and how they played. Gless, do you see any way that the Vipers, with their quarterback position the way it is, do you see any way that they, you know, come out on top and get their first win? Which it's basically a must win for the Vipers. First the yeah, it is. This weekend. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, it, it's it's a must win for Tampa. I mean, go down o um, o and four is essentially Can't do a death it. sentence. Now you can't nope. do it now with a ten game, um, ten game season. Uh, real quick before I kind of get into my analysis, uh, DC's uh, favorite right now again at the time of this recording, um, that minus two and a half. Um, the over under lines at forty four. Um, 
this one I also struggled with just like the, just like the last one, the first two were pretty easy for me. Um, but T Tampa Bay is an interesting case because I, I loved what they did on offense last week. They showed what we thought they could be on offense, right? Cornelius, though he didn't play great, he also didn't play awful either, right? Like he he sustained the team in the second half, couple drives yeah. down the field, did the yep. same thing a little bit in the first half. Now they're missing the spark plug. Quentin Flowers, there's no doubt about it. That's the guy that everybody in Tampa wanted to see play quarterback, and he's not even going to be on the field. Um, he's not even going to be in the stadium. So <laughs> it, it's all on Cornelius. Um, I, at this time, I don't believe Truesdell is going to play. Am I right no. on that? I, yeah, he hasn't practiced. I, done yeah. he, has, he hasn't practiced. But, uh, again, I, I love what Tampa Bay has in the backfield. I also l really like what they have at the receiver position. So – I think that this game is going to be tight as well, just like a couple, you know, just like the um, the Houston and the Dallas game. Um, DC to me took a massive step back uh, backwards last week. Now, can DC kind of lick its wounds and get back on it? I I think so. I I think Cardell Jones, um, you know, what they've been able to do at least in the first two games is hit a lot of big plays. And a lot of big plays for him outside the pocket. He didn't really get to do that last week, right? They their game plan was keep him in the pocket, make him make decisions, and he made a lot of bad ones. Um, I think the pockets break down again. I think he makes some plays with his legs. Tampa Bay is very susceptible to the big play. I don't think this is a recipe Tampa can um, can win on, and certainly can't beat a team like DC. So I think DC wins. I think they cover the two and a half, um, and then. Uh, I'm going to take the under here. Uh, I don't see a lot of points being scored here, um, but I do see D I, DC kind of winning and uh, covering that two and a half line. Kenny, I am so interested to see what you have to say about this game. <laughs> this was a this was a tough this was a tough game for me. This is a really tough game for me to analyze. Uh, like Gless said, I'll echo what Gless said. It, you know, one hand DC's coming off probably the worst performance we've seen from a team all year. Um, it was really bad. They went out to LA. They laid a big egg. We uh, talked about it. Yeah, them and them are New York. That's what I said. Yeah, well, them are New York. Probably had the two worst performances we've seen. But yeah, you know they lost thirty nine to nine, and so they're coming off of that. And look, it, what what DC team are, are we going to see here? Is it going to be the team we saw the first two weeks? Who I'm not totally convinced isn't a mirage because they've now what we've seen they've beaten a very very dysfunctional and very very poor New York team. And they beat a Seattle team that, you know, hasn't been overly Kinda impressive iffy. either. Yep. So what what are and then they actually go and play a team that is firing all cylinders and they and they totally get throttled. So what team are we gonna see? That's my question. And what Tampa team are we gonna see? I think the Quinn Flowers stuff is overhyped. I don't buy as much as this, this is a whole dysfunctional thing, to be honest. I really don't. I, I think if he was good enough to play, he'd be playing. Plain and simple. Coaches don't do don't just purposely not play their best player just out of spite that doesn't happen this That's isn't true. a movie this isn't a movie this is professional football so if he was good enough to start he would have been cornelius is the guy right now he's got another week of first team reps underneath them and i think tampa goes in and gets their first it's a must win game they go in and they get their first win of the season i think it's going to be a tight mm. game i think it's going to be close but i think tampa with josh banks nikita whitlock and the guys they have on defense are going to pressure cardell the same way la did they're going to force him into mistakes and tampa is going to win the game they're going to cover that two and a half and and they're finally going to get in the win the win column. I really believe that. So that this is their week. Mm. They're a team that has to win. And when you are in a must win situation, you either rise and perform, or the pressure gets to you. Um, and I'm a little concerned that you're starting a rookie quarterback in a game that you just have to have. Bottom line, you got to have it. it. And and it's just crazy against that the wall, four, man. <laughs> four weeks into the season, your your season could be done. Um, if you lose this game, so that's a lot of pressure. And then, I know, I know what I know what you're saying, Kenny, with the Quentin Flowers stuff. But I feel like Quentin Flowers means so much more to that team than just what he brings on the field, especially to that fan base and just the morale. I mean, just for him being in that area, going to South Florida. I mean, we've seen it all over internet. Like, fans wanted Quentin Flowers to get his shot, and now that might not ever happen. So I'm just worried. I'm yeah. concerned about the atmosphere into this 
What do you mean? Uh, oh, I mean, the fans also he... want the fans also want Tim Tebow and Johnny Manziel in the league too. Like, come on, I've it, no, no, no. But Quinn Flowers organization. When Quinn no Flowers played, he was should effective. Ever listen to the fans. No professional organization should ever listen to the fans. About I'm not saying field that field they don't listen to the fans. I'm saying, open your ears, Kenny. I'm saying that the atmosphere <laughs> in the game, uh, it was a pretty good atmosphere last week versus Houston. I'm concerned about that this week, especially after the loss and after losing Quint Flowers. I mean, we're just seeing it. Like, people want to see Quint Flowers. And when he was in, he was four for six for like 70 yards. He ran the first touchdown in in Vipers history. I mean, he definitely meant something to that team. I, I think him leaving is not just, you know, ah, we'll start Taylor Cornelius, who's a rookie quarterback out of who, Oklahoma who, State. And, who who I think who uh, I arguably think played just as well as Flowers did last week. Maybe not in maybe not from a completion percentage standpoint, but once he got in a he group, barely threw over fifty percent. He also had two total touchdowns as well and had more rushing yards. Quarterback than, sneak, than, I mean he also had more rushing yards than Flowers did too. Let's not act like he played I bad. mean he also played a lot more than Flowers. I think Flowers would have got Oh, overcome I'm, that if he actually got a snap in I'm, the second half. I'm just half. saying Look. when he got in a rhythm that the team was close. It's not like they got blown out just because he was on the field. He played three fourths of the game. He also threw they, a terrible pick that cost them the also game. Lost. He's a rookie quarterback. He's a rookie quarterback. But my I mean, thing is Aaron Aaron Murray is back now and he's still not getting the start. I guess I mean I know he hasn't played since week one, but if he's your guy, he must not be physically ready to go. Or I feel like he would be starting right, Gless. Uh, that that's my thing is I don't think he's fully healthy. Um, I, I think he's getting out there. He's probably getting some reps in, get getting back familiar with the offense, kind of testing his health. But I think he's out there for emergency. Uh, I don't think that he's ready to go yet. Yeah, I agree yeah. with that. So, so I just I think that DC is going to I don't think maybe they're not as good as we saw in week one and week two, but they're definitely not as bad as we saw in week three. Um yep. I, I mean, we've that. been high on that L.A. team, and now that Josh Johnson's back, we kind of saw what they were capable of. And I think that D.C. just got hit with a haymaker early in the in the fight, um, and they weren't able to, you know, really, they, were, they were stunned. They, they, they didn't know what was happening to them, and by the time they collected themselves, it was too late. Um, and I know that this is a must-win for the Vipers, but I think the talent that D.C. has, especially on the defensive side, facing off against a rookie quarterback that, you know, when the moments have been big, he hasn't been able to perform. And, I mean, it's nothing against Taylor Cornelius. He's a rookie quarterback. So, I mean, it is what it is. But I think Cardell Jones is going to have a bounce-back game. Um, like Gless said, they've been – the Tampa Bay Vipers secondary has been, you know, very susceptible to um, big plays. And I think that D.C. is going to hit a couple of them downfield. And I think they're ultimately going to win this game. And I think the Vipers are going to be really reeling after this. Um, so, th those are our picks. Uh, in the comment section below, we would love to know what your picks are. So we're different on what the last two games, the Sunday games, we have some yep, yep, um, Sunday games, yep, division in the ranks, <laughs> unlike last week. So uh, we'll see. It should be a lot of interesting games, some good matchups, some huge matchups, uh, specifically for the teams that really need to get in the win column. Yep. Uh, so let us know what your picks are in the comment section below, and follow us on XFL Chalk Talk at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube for the latest news. And follow us today on the Discord app. We'll put a link in the description below mm -hmm. so you can chat with the show live during the games. It's been a lot of fun these first few weeks, yep. uh, kind of just analyzing, breaking down what's going on during the game. So make sure you check yep. us out on the Discord app as well. Enjoy the games this weekend, everybody, and we will uh, touch base with you after Sunday's games. What's up, football fans? This is Coach Gless. Want to know how to listen to all of our segments on the go? You can subscribe to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, and iHeartRadio. Subscribe on your favorite podcast platform today. Don't forget to rate us and give us that five-star review.